Welcome to our webinar this evening. My name is Samantha King um, and I'd like to introduce myself both as the chairperson of the Northern Beaches Youth Interagency, as well as the executive officer of the Business Education Network. Tonight's webinar is transitioning to high school. Um, it's definitely a topic that this year we believe um, is more prevalent and, and more important than ever, given that our year sixes of 2021 have had two years of COVID leading up to what's gonna be a fairly significant transition period of their life. Um, Tonight's webinar is a collaboration between the Northern Beaches Council, um, their youth arm, KLOF, which stands for Keep a Lookout For, um, the Business Education Network, my organisation, and the Northern Beaches Child and Family and Youth Interagencies. We're also very lucky this evening to have the support of members from Council's Youth Advisory Group joining us, who'll be sharing some thoughts and insight on their own journeys in that transition. I'd like to commence by acknowledging uh, that we're hosting and recording this meeting um, tonight from the lands of the Camaragal people. I also acknowledge the traditional custodians of the various lands on which we all work, live and play on today, um, and the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples past, present and emerging, as well as those participating in tonight's webinar. Um, a little bit of housekeeping. Um, the there is an opportunity for you to post questions um, and put comments in the chat. If you want to do Q&A, you can opt to be anonymous, which is fine. If you do want to participate in the chat, feel free to change your profile name if you wish. Um, everyone's mics will be muted, um, so please do use that chat. We have um, Justin and Sasha from Council who will be moderating all of the comments to help us get through the information really promptly at the end of the webinar. Um, the webinar is being recorded this evening and it will be available via the Council's website, um, which will have key timestamps in the different sections and topics that will be of relevance for you. Um, we feel that it'll be a great opportunity potentially to revisit this if you aren't listening in with your young person, because there may be some information that they will hear firsthand. Um, tonight's presentations will be from Maria Camino from the Northern Beaches Child and Family Interagency, as well as Dr. Michael Carr Gregg. Um, we will be doing the presentations back to back and follow that with a Q&A session. Um, they're here to share some advice, um, both from a local perspective and obviously from a higher level COVID impacted perspective um, around some of the challenges that uh, a young person may consider, where to get help, um, and, and I guess some insight on what the journey ahead looks like. Um, I guess without further ado, I would like to introduce our first presenter, uh, Maria Camino. So Maria, uh, Maria's roles have encompassed supporting families in school settings. Maria is currently the Child, Family and Youth Project Worker at Relationships Australia. In this role, she facilitates parenting programs, is the primary school's coordinator and the chair for the interagency. So for those of you who aren't aware, interagencies are really vital networks across the community. Um, there's a child and family network and a youth network, which brings together all the services in our region that support those families. And as you can imagine, child and family and youth interact um, and intertwine quite a bit. So without further ado, um, I'll hand you over to Maria. Thank you. Thank you very much, Samantha. It's lovely to be here this evening and lovely to have you all here. Um, it's really exciting to see the opportunities that online has and the opportunities to learn and share and grow together. Uh, so yes, likewise, I wish to pay respects to our elders past and present and emerging uh, and honour and respect the land on which we are meeting on tonight all throughout Sydney. Uh, I know that we are meeting um, based, focused specifically on the northern beaches, but I have heard that this has gone, this event has gone far and wide. So while most of what I'll be talking about will focus on the northern beaches area, it doesn't mean that this doesn't relate to other areas as well. So uh, if you've got questions about that, feel free to post in the chat as well. I'm happy to share about that. Um, so yeah, um, but there is a lot of information out there. So excited to be here to share that with you. So I will share screen tonight for a little bit of it. So we'll see how we go with this. Um, so, as was mentioned, I am the chairperson of the Northern Beaches Child and Family Interagency. 
Uh, I do actually have the privilege of chairing quite a few child and family interagencies, and it's such a privilege to see how they all work together and how they connect. So a little bit about child and family inter or child and family interagencies or interagencies in general. Um, interagencies meet together. They, it is made up of local community services, uh, the local council. So Northern Beaches Council is very involved. Uh, as well as local community organisations, such as organisations that you may have heard about, such as Relationships Australia, uh, Catholic Care, the Burdekins Association, Dalwood Spilstead. Um, we all work together to collaborate, to network, to grow together, uh, to share information, um, but essentially it's keeping children at the centre of what we do. Um, so we don't work in silos, we don't work alone and we don't keep our information alone, but we collaborate in terms of what we're doing at the moment, what general need there is in the community and how can we all work together to pool our resources to meet the needs. So it's not talking about individual situations or individual people, it's talking about the collective and what's happening in our local region. And it's keeping children at the centre of that. Um, we want them to be safe and healthy and well. Uh, we want them to feel connected and well resourced. Um, so we do share a lot of information, service updates, if there's waiting lists, if there's not waiting lists. Uh, we collaborate in terms of parent education and professional development. So I'll share a couple of the events that have been happening recently um, across the interagencies. Um, but there's a lot of networking and understanding and sharing what goes on. Um, we do a lot of that building connection, as mentioned. So we might meet twice, once, once every two months or so. So the interagencies might meet, have a, have a talk, learn about some new things that are going on, but also share updates, share information, get to know each other. It's much easier to call Kate at this at Catholic Care than it is to say, I don't know where to start. So as we build those relationships and as we work together as one interagency, but as several interagencies, it means that you get the service that you need and the support that you need. Um, we also get the feedback, whether it's the positive feedback or the negative feedback, um, and grow in that capacity as well. Uh, often we'll get um, to the opportunity to develop partnerships and collaborations. Uh, so often we'll work on events such as this and pool our resources so that you get the best benefit and you get the opportunity to have something that maybe one of us may not have been able to do, but together we can get, go further, um, which is really exciting and building those connections, whether that's amongst each of the services or meeting the community and meeting people who need the services and the support. As mentioned, there's quite a few interagencies that meet together. So they're not funded by anyone in particular. Often they're voluntary. So all the organizations in the area might meet together. They'll set aside a time. Someone will volunteer a space or their Zoom account as it would have been lately and meet together at that set time. So if you work in the multicultural community to support the community there, they'll meet together, child and family, uh, domestic violence is a big issue. So they all work together to support each other and provide the best care um, and the youth as well, uh, which is a growing need. And it's been very much something that council is aware of and community is aware of. So everyone works together to support each other, especially at times like this when we've all been so drastically affected by things like COVID and lockdown, there's been increased need for support and capacity, but then the same amount of resources. So the more we work together, the more support you get you receive. Okay, so all those opportunities to learn and benefit. Um, benefiting the clients is where we're at in the end. Um, we want to grow and learn for ourselves so that we in turn can support you as you grow and learn. So a lot of what I do is passing on information. There is a lot of events that go on around the area. So we spend a lot of time passing on that information so that we hope that you find out about events such as this or resources or new services or changing services or even growing services. So often the funding changes and then capacity builds for services to be able to offer increased support. 
uh, for the community, which is really exciting. Um, and we're all wanting to offer wraparound support so that if you, there's no wrong door. So I'll come back to that a little bit later. So for example, um, one of the things that we do, this is the example of one of the events that we had last week, actually. So one of the interagencies had a capacity building event for the local community. And that was a really exciting one because we were able to, again, pull resources together and invite Karen Young, who is the, um, she started Hey Sigmund. If anyone knows that website, it's a great website. And we did some brilliant training with that. And that was really exciting to see that happen, but any, everyone be able to have access to a cost-effective, um, really good training service. Um, so that hopefully in turn, that has a knock-on effect for the local community. Uh, and then in, as well as that, we often get events such as tonight or even tomorrow night, um, which is another event that will be happening. And again, these are free events for the community. And again, it's the only in at that working collaboration um, that we can make that possible. So for you, where can you go? There is probably a million services or you may not know of any services in the local area. Um, can you think of any that you might want to go to? Would you go to for yourself or would you recommend for someone else? Often, unless you need it yourself, you probably wouldn't go to it, but it's so helpful to know about these organizations um, in a, a, as a preventative measure, but also to know who offers what. Um, wonderfully, there is no wrong door. So most of the people who work in community services um, will be able to point you in the right direction. So even if they're not the right service, they can point you to other areas and other places to go. Um, they're quite a supportive and close knit and they work really hard to support the community. Uh, so they will want to get you to the right support that you need. Um, there is a number of organizations that are local. So you've got a good one-stop shop or starting point at least with wonderful information is the Northern Beaches Council. So going to their website, you can find a wealth of resources there. And from there, you can go out and beyond. Community Northern Beaches provides great support for the local community, both multicultural and parenting programs, but also casework, advice. You can go there and say, I've got this question. Dalwood Spielstead works with dads. It works with young people. Um, they run programs and support. So they're also a great organization to go to as well. Women and Children First provide casework and support. Uh, Catholic Care provide counseling. They've got play therapy program, um, play therapy. They've got a whole range of programs as well as parenting programs, as, um, which is really helpful, especially knowing that they're in the local area. Uh, they also have a program that supports young people who I think have young people who have children um, earlier than they might have planned to. So there's lots of good support out there. And that's just one of the organizations that does that. Then you've also got the Burdekin Association that works with youth. Uh, and then you've got Relationships Australia, who again does um, parenting programs, group work, but also one-on-one -on -one casework. So all of these organizations are based in the local area, but then as well as that, you've also got some that, are, that work in the local area that aren't necessarily based in the local area. So Family Connect and Support is one organization that is online. So you can call them and say, I need help with A, B, and C. Headspace have got an office, I think in Brookvale. So they're also really good in terms of mental health, youth support, groups, counseling, and uh, most of these services are all free. And then you've also got a great online um, resource called Emerging Minds. So that offers a lot of resources and training and um, information about mental health, but also change in life or growing, those different stages of growth and development that we all go through. So different advice. All of these connection op opportunities center around you. So these are for all people in the community. So it's working out what you need, who you can you access, how do you talk to them? Like I said, there is no wrong door. So start somewhere if you need that support, get in before it becomes an issue. There's nothing wrong with getting in early because the earlier you can get into these services, if you find that you're needing advice, information, support, the more quickly you'll get that support and get out of the situation that you're in and get that support that you need. 
Okay. Um, that's about it from me. I did want to share one new resource that we will send out to you all. Um, as I mentioned, the lovely joys of working together means that we can put resources together as well. Um, and this is one that we've just finished preparing because so often the community people working in local government, local council, um, know about each other, um, local community services. We all know about each other and know how to get the help needed. But so often people in the community don't know where to start. So we've been working hard to develop a resource uh, that supports you to know where to start, where to go to, who to talk to and where to get that advice that you need. So I'll just share. I think it's going to get sent out to all of you in the next few days. But we found that this is a great way to know where to start. So it's just a little resource. So it can get printed or it can stay as an online thing that you can refer back to. But it gives a really good summary of all the services that are local. Um, they might be relevant for you or they might not be or they might be helpful to someone else that you know. So it's a good starting point. Okay, well, that's it from me. I hope I haven't gone too fast, but no. love to Thanks, Maria. Anyways. We've had some couple of comments and I think it's probably worth clarifying for anyone who's joined a little later, just to clarify oh, that um, the importance of why we have child and family um, presenting as well as um, Dr. Michael Cargreg is because as parents, and I can say for myself as a parent of a year six child who's moving into high school next year, um, in primary school, you get a lot more support individually for your child. So once you hit high school, there is a need to be able to be more aware of where to go and, and access information. Um, and part of tonight's presentation is being able to provide as much information as you can to parents, carers and young people so that they can get a bit of insight as to um, what lies ahead, where they can go and get support and know that there, there is support there for them. Um, so I think just, just to clarify those few questions that have come up, um, but we'll now move across to um, our presentation. Can I, Sorry. Can I Sorry. jump in? Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Um, and to add to that, so often we've found, as community services do, we talk. <laughs> and what we've found is that over the last couple of years, yes, there's that need for looking after those children who go into kindergarten and starting school, but often kids in year five and six will often get missed out because high school gets looked after with the youth interagencies or youth services. But as you're going up to those age range, that's where it gets a little bit of a gray, becomes a bit of a gray area. So it's been love, it's a lovely privilege for me to be here um, to, and to work with Samantha and the youth interagency to be able to support you and support that's a more seamless transition. Because so often you find, you never know until, until you get to it that there's suddenly a black hole and we wanna prevent those black holes happening. Exactly, well said. Thanks, Maria. Um, so now I will be handing over to Justin Burt from Council. We have had some technical issues, which has meant that part of tonight's presentation from Michael will be, uh, Dr. Michael Cargreg will be recorded. However, he will be joining us for the Q&A. Um, so I will pass over to Justin to deliver that presentation. Justin. Good evening and uh, welcome to this part of the Northern Beaches Council uh, webinar on transitioning to high school. I am Michael Cargreg and for various reasons I've had to pre-record this particular section but I hope very much to be able to join you live at the end of the uh, webinar so perhaps we can take some questions. But before I start um, I'd like to do uh, a welcome to country. I'd like to acknowledge that uh, I'm broadcasting on Aboriginal land. The Wurundjeri people have lived in harmony with the land and the waterways of this area for many centuries. And I'd like to pay my respects to elders, uh, past, present and emerging. And I'd also like to thank Justin and his team for uh, yet another invitation to uh, help out my friends 
um, and the community of the Northern Beaches, which is uh, where my parents lived for many, many years. And I'm profoundly attached to uh, your part of Sydney. So I am a psychologist that works in the media. I've written a few books. Um, I've raised two young people, both of whom transitioned to high school reasonably successfully. And um, I'm a part owner in a thing called School TV. When it comes to transition from primary school uh, to secondary school, I think we have to recognise that it's an extremely significant time of change. In fact, the research from the New South Wales Centre for Education, Statistics and Evaluation actually highlights a decline in student engagement in their education and their sense of belonging as they move from being a big fish in a small bowl to a little fish in a big bowl. I think that's very, very important. So it is a time of uh, potential decline. We've got to guard against it. So there are lots of experts that I've uh, worked with over the, the years. And I think transition to high school would be tough uh, without a global uh, pandemic, but I think that's obviously in the mix now more so than ever before. Andy Fuller basically has uh, made the comment that this transition can be one of the toughest times in a child's life. John Irvine, the famous child psychologist from uh, Newcastle uh, acknowledges that it can be a, a time full of fun, excitement and new experiences, uh, but it can also be challenging and worrying and that he says the secret lies in planning. And my co-author of a book that we wrote on the topic, Sharon Witt, a teacher, basically says that for most, it just takes adjusting. And she acknowledges as an educator that they've got a lot to, to handle uh, in a very short space of time. And uh, I think that's, that's true. Before COVID-19, I think there were six reasons why starting high school would be stressful. One is obviously you're gonna miss old friends. The second is you're suddenly confronted with a completely different school layout. Uh, you dealing with new teachers um, and lots of them and a whole lot of new people. And you might be temperamentally a little bit shy or nervous about talking to new people. And you're gonna be pretty exhausted from adjusting to all this, this new stuff. And for some students, they tell us that they're a bit worried about being bullied. And this will depend of course on their previous experience um, in primary school. I think the, the key thing though, is that we have to set the tone. Uh, we should be, as adults, uh, going with great enthusiasm to orientation events. We should spend a lot of time talking about how exciting high school was for us or their brothers or sisters. Uh, we need to be really positive about the transition ourselves. Kids are fabulous imitators, so we need to give them something fabulous to imitate. Uh, and I think we need to very slowly build excitement around these new opportunities. And this involves obviously encouraging them to make friends. And if they don't know how to do that, then a really key part of the preparation is to talk to them about how to make friends at school. And my good friends at Reach Out have a couple of fantastic fact sheets on how to make friends at school. And one of my favorite, which is the nine things not to say or do when meeting someone new. And I think it's a really good idea that you print these out and leave them lying around uh, spontaneously for your sons and daughters to have a bit of a read of. Uh, what can we do to make this transition even easier? Look, the whole idea is that by the time they arrive in their new school, they'll already feel a little bit part of it. Uh, and that's why orientation days to meet teachers and potentially other uh, students to enjoy a fun uh, day of, of activities is very, very important. It's a key part of the preparation. I've got to say most schools now do this and do it brilliantly, much better than in my day. Now, a lot of parents, um, not just on the Northern beaches, but everywhere, are really concerned about whether or not 
their child will be behind as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic. There's no question that some kids benefited enormously from uh, remote learning, others hated it, uh, and a, a, another group just endured it. So I think that we have to take that into account. Um, I've got to say that the um, response I would like most from parents is to reassure them that everybody's in the same boat and that the teachers are there to help them catch up. And the most important thing right now is their well-being. You cannot have learning without well-being. So to me, that's from the University of the Bleeding Obvious. Um, when Sharon and I wrote this book, of course, we had no concept of COVID-19 or um, global pandemics, uh, lockdowns um, and remote learning, but we still believe that these principles apply. So once your son or daughter has started year seven, we think it's really important that you check in regularly to see how they're going. And I'll give you a three step plan to do this. The first is to basically check in every day and ask them just initially, um, are they okay? Uh, how did it go? And um, when they tell you anything, rather than just move on from it, I think a really good phrase for a year seven student is help me understand a little bit more about that. And then whatever they say to you, my advice is that you paraphrase back to them what it is that they've said. This does two things. One, it enables them to clarify what it is they were saying to you, but also gives a very clear impression that they have been listened to and understood. So to me, that's a, a three-step um, program, a three-step uh, communication strategy, which is just gold. The second is to establish proactive relationships with their teachers, head of house, however it's structured, um, to explore uh, how they're going to manage their time and, and uh, talk to them about the different study techniques that are on offer, to ensure that the fundamentals of well-being are taken care of, enough sleep, adequate diet and exercise, and to make sure, of course, that they're just managing um, the load, both at school and at home. The fundamentals of parenting um, shouldn't change. And what you have to understand is that in the midst of every transition is an invitation to grow. And uh, they are really given an opportunity now to form new friendships, to emancipate from you, uh, to figure out the answer to the question, uh, who am I, or begin to figure out the answer to that question, which is a great question. Um, and of course, to learn how to learn, because they're going to have to acquire those skills for future economic independence. Now, if your child is having trouble, my advice is that you don't wait for things to improve on their own. Yes, I want you to get your kid talking about how they're feeling. Let them know that feeling worried is normal and see whether or not initially you can problem solve some strategies together. But if things don't improve within two to three weeks, I really think that's when you've got to consider speaking with your child's teacher, their uh, year level coordinator, the um, welfare staff, uh, or even your GP. I don't think you should leave it too long. The other issue, of course, is to be aware of signs of psychological trouble, to notice these signs. And a lot of people think, well, depression in kids is about low mood. Um, it, it's actually also about irritability and boredom, uh, deter disturbance of our appetite and sleep. Um, it's no longer wanting to be with your mates. Um, being really angry um, out of nowhere, it seems completely out of character, not being able to focus and concentrate on your lessons, bursting into tears for no particular reason, and a decline in the kind of things that they usually love doing. So to me, 
pretty important kind of components uh, to be on the lookout for. And one of these things by themselves in a day is to be expected. But if you've got a cluster of these things over a prolonged period of time, say two, three weeks, that's when we need to get some help because that's clinically of great significance. So we know what the protective factors in the lives of year seven students are. And um, most of you will know this, but I'm uh, letting you know now. And the first is to find a connection to a, a non-parental adult at um, uh, in, in their environment. And that can be an uncle, an aunt, it can be a teacher, um, a sports coach in a club. But I think these connections with other adults are crucial. Uh, feeling safe at school goes without saying. All schools have a legal obligation to provide a safe environment for your sons and daughters to learn in. Uh, having really good friends. So obtaining, maintaining and retaining positive peer relationships. It's actually one of the greatest predictors of well-being going around. So paying attention to that. Uh, overall being resilient, and I'll talk a little bit about that. Um, feeling safe in your neighbourhood, knowing where to go for help, uh, getting a reasonable degree of academic achievement, you know, not failing everything. Um, and uh, obviously feeling supported by your, your mum and dad. Now we know that if you've got more of these um, factors in their lives, it bodes very well for a smooth transition. We also have to help them uh, adjust. And there are some young people who are, by the time they get to year seven, inveterate people pleasers. Now this goes beyond simple being nice to people, it actually means that they edit or alter their words or what they do for the sake of other people. Uh, and they go out of their way to do things for people in their lives based on what they assume the other people want or need. So they give up their time and energy to get people to like them. And I think that we need to recognise that these young people may in fact have low self-esteem, they may need other people to like them, they might, may not do conflict well and find it hard to say no. Um, they basically will accept responsibility for things that have nothing to do with them. They're really quick to agree to something even when they completely don't want to do it. They struggle with being themselves and any conflict upsets them. And underneath it all is probably a fear of rejection. Now, if you have a young person in your life who's a little bit like that, that's really important that we talk to them and role play not being a people pleaser before uh, they, they turn up. Uh, to me, that's important. And one of the most common psychological problems in um, Great year seven students is anxiety disorder. And we need to recognize this and deal with it. It's very common in um, our primary school cohort. And we see it spill over into year seven. Um, and it, but it really does warrant a discussion. So if you've got a kid who, for example, um, doesn't really feel uh, good about virtually anything around primary school. They're, they've got this what if narrative, it's anxiety all the time. That's obviously not a good thing. But it's really important to state that a little anxiety is not a bad thing. If I'm asking you to run across for whatever reason, this um, six lane highway, I'd want you to be a little anxious because if you're not anxious, you're gonna get squished. But the way I explain anxiety to young people is it's a little bit like a smoke alarm. So we have smoke alarms and it's really good when there's smoke that they go off, but it's not helpful if they go off all the time in the absence of smoke. In this analogy, we've got young people who basically have a smoke alarm and it goes off when they should appropriately be anxious. But if they're anxious all the time, then that's 
clearly not helpful. There are lots of different types of anxiety disorder. The most common that we see in year sevens is generalized anxiety disorder, a little bit of separation anxiety disorder, and some social anxiety, which is really where you're frightened of people. Um, and again, if your child displays some of these um, uh, char characteristics, you need to do something about it. The first thing is parents shouldn't reassure them all the time because reassurance falls on deaf ears. Anxious brains don't process um, information in the same way that non-anxious brains is. And it's really difficult for your child to think clearly. So don't do that. Uh, when they've calmed down, it's a really good idea um, to get your son or daughter talking about their worries by just writing down a worry list and making a list uh, in order all their worries from the most to the least. Brilliant idea because just the act of recognising and writing down the worries can sometimes make them feel less intimidating. The third technique is just as we as adults uh, calm our breath, you calm your mind, so children can too. And I would just suggest a simple relaxation technique with your year seven that we practice before year seven starts, such as taking three deep, really slow breaths, breathing in for a count of three, and then out for three, and just repeating that 20 times. It's a really good way to get them to tune into their body and recognize that they can um, calm themselves down. There's a neat little app uh, called Reach Out Breathe, which uses the uh, camera on your phone uh, to pick up your heartbeat and it literally um, will teach you to control your breathing. This is a free app. And one of the advantages, of course, of giving kids an iPhone in year seven, um, apart from the security component, is you can put really useful apps on this, um, on their phone to help them practice calming down. The other app that I'm, I'm pretty keen on for year sevens is Smiling Mind, because research has shown that mindfulness can reduce anxiety and depression, and it teaches um, our year sevens to respond to stress with a kind of awareness of what is happening in the present moment, rather than simply acting instinctively and being unaware of what emotions or, or motives might be driving their decision. Um, so that's a little cracker. And the fifth is if you've really got a problem with anxiety in your year seven, give this a, a, a go. This is a free evidence-based program run by the University of Queensland and Beyond Blue called the BRAVE program. It's an interactive online evidence-based cognitive behavioural therapy program, which helps prevent anxiety in children, teenagers. And of course, there's a complimentary program for parents as well. So give that a go. I'm also a bit of a fan of Mood Gym, um, which was put together by Helen Christensen and Kathy Griffiths. And it's now over 20 years old. I think it's had seven randomized controlled trials and it really helps your grade seven identify um, when they're having problems with emotions like anxiety and depression. Uh, the old fashioned people could, could read a book. I very rarely uh, recommend books I don't write, but this is a, a beauty. Um, called Good Thinking by Sydney psychologist Sarah Edelman and Louise Ramond. So I like, like, might like to give that a go uh, if they're not into uh, the computer stuff. So I think there are three important messages for your sons and daughters around year seven. And they are, if you can't change something, change the way you think about it. Uh, there is a wonderful opportunity for you to talk to them about your experiences at school and uh, to recognise that while we can't necessarily control everything that happens to us, we can always control how we think about it. And that to me is a very important um, uh, message. The see life as it is, but focus on the good bits. I mean, the positive emotions like joy and gratitude inspiration and pride aren't just great at the time. 
the research shows that if you regularly re-experience them, think about them, that can create an upward spiral and that helps to build your resources. So although I think in year seven, you have to be realistic about life's ups and downs, it really helps to focus um, on the good aspects of any situation. Um, think about the glass half full rather than the glass half empty. I think it can make such a big difference. And I think the really important thing is about relationships. You know, going into grade seven provides them with an opportunity to build relationships. And the research tells us now that people with strong and broad social relationships are happier, healthier and live longer. And we know that close relationships with family and friends provide love and meaning and support and increase people, people's feelings of, of self-worth. So uh, teaching our sons and daughters to take action, to strengthen our relationship and build connections, it's essential uh, for wellbeing. So I think um, the final comments that I'd like to make um, really are on, on parenting itself. And I think the principles of great parenting in year seven don't change. I wrote this book a few years ago. We'd still have to have a developmental perspective. We still need to recognize that a unique characteristic of year sevens is an inability to predict the consequences of their actions, um, that we need to set limits and boundaries, have consequences and create family rules. Doing it together, having a uh, bit of a collaboration on that, a really good idea. Um, say no, that's the vitamin N, to things that are inappropriate. Foster empathy, display kindness, and most importantly, keep the lines of communication open. So keep calm, that unflappable Zen neutrality. Don't talk too much, listen more. Always look for compromise and negotiation. And most importantly of all, use humour. Keep it upbeat. Don't use sarcasm. Uh, don't use put downs because that'll trigger defensiveness and shut down the very communication you're trying to keep open. But clear boundaries, only arguing over things that matter, things that relate to their health and well-being. That's the most important thing. And remember, their brain is a work in progress. It is not fully formed and therefore we have to bear that in mind. I think above all, um, we need to make sure that we are the ones who are the frontal cortex of young people. Remember, it goes very, very quickly. John and Julie Gottman remind us that there are 940 Saturdays between a child's birth and she or he leaving for university, TAFE, uh, or the workforce. Uh, now, if your child is going into year seven, a good 350 of those Saturdays are already gone. So make the most of them. Uh, and remember the words of Tony Blair, um, who once said our young people are 20% of the population, but 100% of the future. Uh, I hope you found this useful and I hope to join you later on. But right now, back to our host. Thanks very much. And there he is in the flesh. Hi, hey, how are you? Joining us. That was great timing. Um, we're going to just segue off your presentation um, and introduce our three young people that are with us this evening um, and then kick off the Q&A that way. So we've got Luke, uh, a Year 12 student from Marta Maria. We have Sasha, a Year 12 student from Northern Chroma Campus, it's such a long name, that one. And Claudia, a year 10 student from Manly Selective Campus. So welcome, guys. Um, now, as a parent of a, a, of a young fella going into year seven, I am keen to hear your answers on this. Um, so we'll just start off and, and we'll go Luke, Claudia, Sasha. Um, can you guys share with us tonight, what were you looking forward to about going to high school? Yeah, so I definitely, um, there's a few things that I definitely looked forward to. Um, when going to high school, I thought um, initially, it was actually when I thought about that, that it was actually some of the smaller things that I found exciting, just like the change of scenery, the fact that there was a new class that I'm going to be 
like meeting new teachers and even like a um, times table and lockers. Though those were like the main things that I had definitely looked forward to. Um, so yeah, I would definitely say it'd be very, I know that was similar with my friends as well that we found um, even just the small things, just exciting and sporting opportunities and things to get involved in as well. Fantastic. What about you, Claudia? What did you look forward to when you joined high school? Were you going to high school? Um, so I was looking forward to the specialised classes because like the teachers teach different subjects. Um, the harder workload, meeting new people, um, joining clubs that the school offered, um, especially the band program. Excellent. And Sasha? I see you've got your picture up. So, oh, there you are. <laughs> What were you looking forward to when you were going off to high school? Um, to meet new people and also learn how to write and read too. Excellent. Now to some of the pickles that we talked about. So back up to you again, Luke. What were you most unsure about or apprehensive about? Yeah, so that I definitely found there were a couple of things. I know that suddenly, um, as has been already been mentioned, being the big fish in a little bowl going into, you know, a whole new practically ocean, what it feels like. Um, senior students were definitely something that had initially freaked me out a little bit. Um, but once you're there, you find that there's actually so many older students who are there for you and there to support you um, in your transition. And I know some schools have, like mine, we have peer counselling, which actually connects um, those older students but that was definitely for me a bit of um, a sticking point and something that I found initially quite frightening. Yep interesting. Claudia? Um, well I didn't know how to study for exams because we didn't have any of those in primary school. Also a lot of high school was unknown like I didn't know how to navigate around the school and I didn't know how to read a timetable. Interesting stuff. I can imagine that. Sash, how about you? What were you worried about? Uh, I was worried about my um, not fitting into school. And that's probably a really big thing. As, as Luke said, being a, a big fish in a little bowl to being the little fish in the big ocean, as you put it, it, it does, it, it does, you know, make you think about what that's going to be like, especially if you're not going there with all your friends. And I think that's probably, a, you know, a decision that, um, some kids may feel comfortable with the parents and some kids may struggle with the decisions that their parents have made about what school they're going to go to and whether their friends are going with them. Um, so once you were there, so you were excited about stuff and then you were worried about stuff, but once you got there, what surprised you once you got to high school? Um, I think initially in year seven, one of the things that surprises you most is the workload. It is a bit of a jump. Um, and I wouldn't say that they necessarily personally dump a workload on year seven, but it's more just adjusting to how that actually works and finding um, new skills in time management and things. Um, your teachers are definitely there um, to support you, but that was something that initially surprised me. I was like, wow, I suddenly have assignments and I'm not actually sure how they work or anything, um, but there was definitely support for me there. Excellent. What about you, Claudia? Yeah, I agree with what Luke said. Also, like recess and lunch, they're shortened by like 20 minutes. And um, also the travel to school, like I didn't travel to primary school because it was walking distance, but now it takes like an hour. So yeah. Yeah, right. Another good, interesting point. And what about you, Sash? What surprised you when you got to school? Um, the, I... The, yeah, the, it only took me one bus to get there and one bus to get home, not like lots of buses. Yep. No. And it was also local. That's a good change. All right, so my last question to you guys, and then we've got some other questions that have come through. If you had one piece of advice for the Year 6 kids or the parents of the Year 6 kids at the moment that they can share with their child, um, about going into year seven, what would it be? So I found, um, obviously, being that student transitioning, and I know my parents had encouraged me to, is um, that although you, it's great to settle in for um, those couple of weeks, 
but as soon as you can get involved in as many extracurricular activities that you can because in that way you'll meet so many new people and you'll find that you have this great network of students your age older students and then also teachers who find that oh this student is actually really interested in what like I have to offer and um, they'll definitely want to capitalize on that and then they'll really enjoy you and value you as a student so I found that getting involved in maybe the SRC or band or sport touch footy public speaking everything you get you make this really great network of like-minded students from all throughout um, your school and as well as teachers who've so got that great network um, that was previously mentioned having those close relationships which I found definitely helped. So can I before we go to Claude so just to unpack that a bit for the parents that are still with us so if you um, obviously if your parents are telling you go and ask but if a young person's coming home and it doesn't sound like they know what's going on if your parents had gone and asked those questions and gave you that information when hey did you know that the school does blah blah blah, blah do you feel that that would be something that would be helpful? Because I think that's yes. where it's hard. Like, you know, primary school parents, we get given a lot of stuff. It's super easy. But when you get to high school, you kind of feel like it's a little bit hands off as a parent. So from a young yes. perspective, you'd be happy. 100%. Yeah, I found that like when you um, discuss like communication side of things, it's not as um, I guess you could say almost spoon fed as it is in primary school. It is a bit of figuring out for yourself. So um I know that the students will hear for themselves these opportunities at things like assembly um, and maybe like there's a chance to join. We use a lot of schools use Google Classroom. I'm not sure if that's used in primary schools at the moment, but that's a way that um, information will be shared about upcoming events and things that you can get involved in. Um, and then you'll a lot of the time parents will be given maybe packages or insights or letters onto like different music ensembles that um, students um, will then find out through them how to um, access those things because I know sometimes when you first go go in you're overwhelmed with all this information but to have a mom or a dad or an older um, adult just kind of guiding you and just saying this is all these opportunities that I think would suit you that would definitely help and kind of sift through that information overload um, that you have as a young student going into year seven. Fantastic Luke and Claudia what's your piece of advice for those new year sevens next year? Um, well, I thought get involved was a really good piece of advice, um, but I would say like taking a break on the weekends, like just leaving one day, either like Saturday on Sunday where you don't do any work. So you're refreshed for the next week because like high school, like involves like a lot of work. So it's good to take a break. Good advice. Might take that myself. What about you, Sash? Um, to... To maybe make a, like, make a friendship group and then with the, um, and then maybe, maybe go out with them a little bit on the weekend. Good. So having some social time as well, making those yeah. new friendships a bit stronger. That's great advice. Well, thank you guys. So I've got a list of questions that have been tossed my way. And the first one is for you, Michael. Um, we have a parent who's a bit concerned about the child moving into year seven, um, hearing things about the pecking order and, and their child being, you know, potentially concerned about bullying and what that looks like in the new ocean, as Luke's put it. So can you share some insight or thoughts there? I can, and I can really recommend the reachout.com website on uh, bullying in schools. There's some really useful resources there. And as I mentioned in my talk, um, the importance of what uh, nine things what uh, of what not to say um, when you're starting at a new school. I think that's a particularly useful thing. But what I would say is go to um, the uh, moderated forums on reachout.com about starting uh, secondary school. And that gives you a sort of counter narrative to the doom, gloom and despondency, which many young people hear. And I would also go out of my way to remind the young person that 
um, all schools now have a legal duty of care to provide students, particularly in year seven, with a safe environment in which to learn. And that there are lots of resources and lots of people that you can talk to at school. Uh, now, no system is perfect, but um, we do have to recognise that times have, have really changed and that schools prioritise now young people feeling safe because we know there's no wellbeing, uh, there's no learning without wellbeing, and yet there's no wellbeing if you don't feel safe. Nope, that makes perfect sense. And I think probably for, for some of the parents, you know, questions around um, you know, there's always been that kind of, oh, my kids are going from primary school to high school. Great. That's no more canteen. I can step back. I get my life back, you know, da, da, da. But it's also not the flip of that becoming the helicopter. I think, um, you know, from what you're saying too around the duty of care, it is important that, you know, that you continue that um, support with a young person's development so that, you know, maybe the first time they mention something, okay, let's talk it through, give them some tools and tips. But if you're getting to the second, the third time, and there's still, you know, the, the, the situation is getting worse, you're not a bad parent for reaching out to the school to say, hello, um, my child's coming home and they're not happy and they're not feeling safe and using that, that terminology to get the right response. Yep, spot on. Cool. I think that probably knowing that, you know, and I know for myself as that parent, my child's primary school is 330 kids. And most of the high schools on the Northern Beaches, North Shore are a thousand plus. So that's a really big leap to go from a really small school to a really, really big school. Um, and teachers are amazing, but they don't have eyes all over their heads. So, you know, being able to make sure that we continue to work in partnership with schools is really, really important. Um, right now, so while we still have you, Michael, we've got a um, question around Mood Gym. So you mentioned in your presentation around Mood Gym um, for Year 7 students, but it actually states that it's for 16 plus. So is there any tools? Because some Year 7 kids are going to be that 11 turning 12 or 12 turning 13. What could they use instead? The BRAVE program is um, especially designed for uh, the younger adolescents, but my experience is that we tend to underestimate the um, capacity of students in year seven. And I've actually got a number of uh, year seven students who have loved Mood Gym and have found it incredibly useful. So with great respect to the uh, recommendation, I think one size doesn't fit all. And uh, you've got some young people and you've got three of them on tonight who were pretty smart. I think they would have been frighteningly clever in year seven and they would have managed Mood Gym without a problem at all. Good advice. I like the one size doesn't fit all. And I think too, for a lot of the parents um, and, you know, it, it's not a reflection on parenting, but if you're not across it, a lot of kids in primary school now are across apps like the Smiling Minds program and things like that. So there is a real culture shift in primary to prepare young people um, to be across using apps and these other tools to be able to manage your mental health and a bit more balance moving forward. So I think the framework is kind of, you know, the, the, the framework's getting built, um, but it's a matter yeah. of being able to continue to support. Um, so now I've got a question uh, for our three students. Would you guys like to share what are the home, what's homework like for year seven? I think I might just jump in there. Um... So for year seven, it's definitely um, it, it's definitely a new experience. It's, it is different from your usual year six homework expectations. Your teachers might encourage you. I know we had a diary to um, keep track of our homework and assignments coming up. Assignments is something that is it was a completely new concept for me. So it is like a for each subject you will have one assignment per term. And at the end, then you have your yearly examination, depending on the school, some do alternative test, testing and things like that. But the idea is that um, if you can get onto the homework as soon as possible, you it's not um, like, and I would say it's not completely overwhelming the workload, but it's definitely a shift that you do need to manage. Um, so just, yeah, as getting on top of it as soon as possible, I don't think there'll be any issues for students if they're, um, just making sure they're ticked it off as soon as they've done it. And some things um, are, you could already do in class anyway, so it's not, not a problem at all. 
So no mucking around. <laughs> yeah, no mucking around, no more. <laughs> Claudia, do you have anything else you'd like to add? Tips for, for anyone thinking about how to juggle homework? Yeah, I found that in year seven, like homework range from like, I've got either no homework or like two hours of homework a day. Um, yeah, but just get it done as soon as possible and then you're fine. Oh, Sasha, would you like to add anything else? Uh, kind of what Claudia said. And also, um, yeah, I didn't get, I can't really remember, but I think I only got a little bit of, of um, work, homework. Yeah, so they'll ease you into it. They're not going to slam you with hours every, for every subject every day. No, excellent. Um, right, we have another question back for you, Michael. So um, any suggestions around supporting um, students that are going from a co-ed primary environment to a single sex school environment? What a good question. Um, look, I think it is a matter of maintaining relationships outside of school. So my understanding and my clinical experience is that, and I'd be interested in the young people's opinion, that the people who do really well in single sex environments are the ones that also maintain friendships outside of the school, obviously with the diversity of sexual, sexual orientations and sexualities. Um, and uh, maintaining those friendships outside of school is actually one of the most important indicators of well-being going forward. So if you are involved in some kind of art, music, dance, drama, sport group, my advice is to maintain that alongside um, your new friends that you'll make in your single sex school. Excellent. Now I know our three young people here all come from co-ed schools, so that's not helpful. However, <laughs> if either any of you guys have got friends that went to single sex schools, Luke, do you want to share? Yeah. So I've got um, a couple of friends who go for like Bridgetine, Stella, that kind of area. Um, I, there's actually a really great thing that I heard my friends say, and it's um, the world isn't one gender. Um, and that's definitely something like I completely agree with Dr. Michael Cargreg in that like it is really important to maintain those relationships and I know that I've been really good friends with those girls who and guys who've gone to um, those single sex schools but for some like obviously it does suit some people more than others um, but yeah I think in terms of maintaining a good transition all through and continuing out through high school exactly just what um, has already been said and just reiterate that. Claudia, Sasha, would you guys like to add anything to that? Um, yeah, I think people like from single sex schools, they tend to get involved in like activities such as cadets or surf lifesaving. Um, but I'm not really sure other than that. Sasha? Uh, I'm not really sure. That's okay. It's all right. It is just good to hear from, from, I guess, from your perspective as three young people, because it is that kind of parting of ways. Some people are going to travel with you to the next, to the next adventure and others are going to have different adventures and being able to, you know, whether you continue to grow together or whether, unfortunately, sometimes you will grow apart because as you get older, you want to do different things and like different things and you become different people and have different hairstyles and all that kind of wild and crazy stuff. Um, so, yeah. Now, um, we have a question here, which um, again, may be for you, Michael, and, and our students is, how much time do or should um, schools be spending on study skills and how to help, you know, how to help your brain process having to go from, you know, anything from four to seven period days. So that's obviously a lot of variation with single uh, subjects and the homework and what you need to do to, to turn that into something. So, Michael, would you like to start that one? Sam, I love it when you ask me a question that there's an evidence base for, which is it. really good. Um, so the 2020 uh, youth survey done by Mission Australia, and I know you're familiar with that youth survey because it surveys about 25,000 15 to 19 year olds every year and has done so every year since 2002. They tell us that the fourth most 
uh, pressing uh, concern of young people, um, even uh, halfway through the first year of the pandemic, was in fact school and study problems. So the answer to you, and that was about 35% of the people surveyed said they were extremely concerned or very concerned about school and study. So I think a lot of effort should be uh, spent on that. Things like um, how to um, work in uh, with, with a study buddy, um, the advantages of that, uh, how to memorize, um, how to uh, learn learn out loud you know I've been going on about that for all the years that you've heard me talk about surviving the whole VCE thing the HSC thing um, I think we need to concentrate on uh, teaching young people how they can learn best and most appropriately uh, I'd be interested to know um, firstly Luke from you whether or not you got any of that instruction at school yeah so my school so I'm at um, Marta Maria um, we actually have a lot of great programs around um, like upskilling um, students in terms of learning different study skills. But um, there is definitely an element where you will have to fill your own gap. So I definitely encourage um, any students who are watching or parents who want to re reiterate to your young person that um, it's a lot of trial and error for what works for you. People learn differently. Um, so whether it's working with a buddy, I know when um, during prelims, which is like our exams, yearly exams for year 11. Um, we actually had a week just to study in home-based learning. So um, basically I just FaceTimed my friends and we just worked through all of our things and that works for me. I'm a bit of a note taker, but whether it's flashcards or it's diagrams or anything, year seven's the, like a great time to experiment what works with you for you with your different researching skills and all those type of things alongside what your school will provide for you as well. I love it. And it's not scripted at all. I'm just gobsmacked at your answers, Luke. It's amazing. Um, Claudia, Sasha, do you guys have anything that you'd like to add on that? Yeah, well, I found that with my school, we didn't really focus on study skills. I think there was like one really short class in year seven on them. But other than that, they kind of just ignored it. So over the years, I've kind of learned from experience mainly than people actually teaching us. And I think that's been pretty bad. I know heaps of my peers like struggle with studying. So yeah. Sasha, would you like to add anything else here? Um, kind of what Claudia said. Yeah. That. Yeah. So it's kind of just about trying to find your own way and try lots of different things, but not necessarily that there's going to be lots of study skill lessons to help you work it out. Yeah. Yeah. No, oh, excellent. Um, now I have a question, which I'm going to start with Maria, and then I think all of you will be able to contribute. Um, starting from Michael's presentation, we talked about the things obviously before COVID that were of concern, but Maria, from what would be now two years worth of COVID impact, what increases have you seen through the interagency? Because child and family and youth yeah. kind of dovetail because youth starts at 12, but you know, yeah, it's always a bit of an intertwined space. What what are we seeing more of in services? Because I think that's something if we know more then people are a bit more tuned to, to look for it. So that's a really good question because as you said, yeah, we do talk a lot and we do compare notes of where the needs are and how do we best allocate services and support um, according to those needs. There's been a, a generalised anxiety increase across Across the board so it's not just the pointy end of kids who are at the most at risk it's general there's been increased anxiety increased stress we've all really felt this um the lockdown and the impact of the lockdown in different ways but we've all felt it um so increased anxiety as we finish things like the year the school year but then also the school like finishing year six and transitioning to year seven you've got all those celebrations and they're all different at the moment. So whether you have a year six formal, a graduation, a party, um, award ceremony, are they happening in the same way? Are you celebrating and noting that in the same way? And often that's actually gonna have to come back to the parents and the family to say, let's 
pause and mark this occasion and remember this occasion and celebrate the achievement of the year. And as a family, really dig deep into this celebration and make it a special time. Um, because often you find that year six formals and things don't happen the same way that they might have normally happened. And they're really important to note and celebrate because everyone has had a tough time, but having to finish without marking those moments of celebration and achievement and the kids have worked really hard um, noticing that and naming that um, is really important no, and that's it's great I think seeing the chatter too around the year six orientation days and the variation about what has actually been on offer whether it has been remote or summer now mm. in the next few weeks um are having face-to-face, -face, but only for the kids. Like they're still doing the parent Zooms, but, you know, they're doing an abridged version to still get the kids on site because they are recognising that it's important for them to spatially be aware of what that transition is going to look like. So um, 100%. And as a mum, I'm a meddling mum for sure. We've organised mm -hmm. a big day out for our year six because the school's hands yep. are tied. Like, unfortunately, there's lots mm -hmm. of stuff going on and it's not about um, what the school chooses to do, but... You know, there's been a lot of strain on being able to shift with all the restrictions. So, yeah, as parents, you know, there's a great opportunity to step up and not necessarily sit back and, and be upset. So I'm all for that. Yeah. Michael? Yes. Uh, yes, um, I'm coming to you, of course, from the lockdown capital of the world in Melbourne. Um, we've had more lockdown than anywhere else. And what I'm finding a lot of schools are doing at the moment is, in fact, they're handing it over to the parents. So I know of about six schools who have are now having informal orientation programs and informal um, sort of grade six celebrations and um, I think some of the schools are, are, are really thrilled that the parents have taken the initiative so it's exactly what you said Sam. Oh, I like it I like it what about you guys how important was that year six send-off for you? I found it personally like it was something that we all really valued and it was definitely kind of it's also like a rite of passage thing and it does almost mentally prepare you for that transition going, okay, now that's one chapter closed, open the next. And it is just really nice to have that like traditional way of going through. It's so unfortunate that for both the year sixes coming to year seven and then the year 12s leaving that they haven't been able to have that exact um, traditional way of send off and everything like that. But in any way possible, it's just, I know like young people really appreciate that like acknowledgement um, as Maria said, of just like how hard they've worked. Like it's a whole school, it's like seven years, it's massive. So just having that proper send off is something that um, I know they will value. Gordia? Yeah, I don't think I have anything to add to that. No, Sash, how about you? No, nothing to add. No, I'll use this as a bit of a segue into a question actually back to you guys, which is when, um, how did you guys feel parting ways with some of your friends from year six when you went to year seven that potentially were going to other schools and things like that? How did you guys manage that space? Um, I find that obviously it is quite sad when you have those really close ties and they are, um, you are separating, but I find like you're really close friends. I know my best friend um, being at a different school, we still acknowledge that we are each other's best friend, even though I like might not see them for several months on end even but just maintaining that contact I know that year seven is a very common time for like um, kids to be getting phones and like social media and things like that so capitalizing on the benefits of that and staying in contact with your friends is so important and you'll find it so funny that when you're coming through school and you'll have like different events and different like parties or anything that you go with your current school friends you'll actually run into your old mates again and it's like just this massive um, meetup and then that's like if those connections were lost, it's a great way of reconnecting. And there's other ways where schools do interact anyways. Excellent. Claudia? Well, um, I only had one other friend who went to a different school. Most of my friends came to my school, so I didn't really have that problem. But that other friend, we kind of lost contact. And I think that's like something important for young people to know that they're not going to be able to keep in contact with everyone. Uh, so being realistic that 
there's going to be all your current friends, a whole lot of new friends, and there's only so many balls that you can juggle. But if they are good friends, so going back to what Luke's saying, then they're going to stay good friends and be comfortable with that. So it's good advice. How about you, Sasha? Um, yeah, just, yeah, just try and try to stay connected. And yeah. That's good advice. Now I have one last one, which may be a bit controversial. It is targeted at Michael, but I think uh, Maria, you'll be able to buy in on this. So last question for the evening, should a parent be setting app and time restrictions on devices once they get to high school? Michael, you're on mute. Is that for me? We'll start with you. When then oh, I'll... okay. Um, look, I, I am big on negotiation. So I actually think that by the time young people are in um, uh, high school, there's two things. There's rights, but what sits alongside the rights are responsibilities. So if you can set some mutually agreed upon expectations around uh, balance in your life, a balance between sport, exercise, um, having fun, being with your friends, uh, going to school, doing your homework uh, and spending time online and that you basically, I would always argue that we will run an experiment. Let's run an experiment for the first couple of weeks and see how it goes. And then we can review how the experiment is going in the first couple of weeks and if necessary, tweak it. So I'm a lover, not a fighter. I like the idea of uh, negotiating with young people and giving them the opportunity to exercise judgment. That's a very diplomatic answer. I love it. Maria, would you like to buy into this? Sure. Uh, one of the things that we've often had conversations about, especially in the last couple of years, is that technology means social life, gaming and school or study or work. How do you separate them out without developing a healthy relationship with them? So it's what Michael said was that having that negotiation, um, setting, the, setting the standard, they're going to copy what you do. As a parent, if you're doing it, gives them permission to do it. So having family values and saying all the technology goes here at a certain time every night or whatever it might be that works for you and your family. There's no one set rule of thumb. Um, but if you're going to set the hard and fast rule, it's there to be broken um, or, or skirted around. I like it. I like it. And the modelling um, is a really, really good point. And, and I know in our family, um, probably not me, but should be, my husband is pretty good at it. He said, actually sets a timer on his phone so that he stops screen time. So there's no checking his Facebook, no looking at Instagram. Like he just switches off and the kids know now when that alarm goes off, oh yeah, dad's, dad's having his time out. Like, so I think not saying that that's something that everyone should do, but, you know, finding those little ways, as you say, to role model, because I know in the work that we do at the Ben, um, and then moving that into that youth space, when we start talking career and transition discussions, um, I think the last time I checked the stats, it was over 80% of young people, despite the way that they react to their parents, still take on board the advice that their parents will give them and the conversations that they hear their parents have around what's a good job, what's a bad job. And that I think really validates that we're not off duty just because the kids have gone to high school. They, they, we're continuing to play a role. It's just a different role. So, yeah. yeah. Now for Luke and Claudia and Sasha, parting words around screen time. Yeah, I think, yeah, like everything that has already been said. Um, I find that if just having that conversation being open as we have already talked about, like kids already know like pretty much like what they think is reasonable. If you ask them, they'll probably give like a really reasonable answer because if they were in the position, I know sometimes like I find myself talking to my, my younger sister and I go, like I'm going, oh, like I, I don't think it would be a good idea. Like if I had a kid just seeing through her, what like, you know, going like, you know, staying up all night on your phone, like that's something I'd be like, no, definitely not. But if you just are open with your, young person then they're definitely going to give a reasonable answer and then so if you can experiment that as um dr michael cargreg said then definitely and then from there you can almost have that conversation of okay well i can step in when i think you know like if they've set their own standards 
I can step in and help you like manage that. So I think that's, I've seen some, something about that. So it seems to be um, the way to go. Cool. What about you, Claudia? What are your thoughts on the technology? Yeah, well, I think managing your time on devices really needs to come from the young person, although like adults can have an influence to a certain extent. Um, but I think a really good thing is like charging your phone or devices outside your room. So like they're not tempted to go get them and bring them into bed or something like that. That's great advice, actually. I have to take that one on board. Sasha, do you have some technology insider advice? Yeah, the same as what Courtney said. Don't don't bring it into the bedroom. I don't think that's a very good idea. Uh, that's excellent. I think we all do. It's all too easy to go. I'll put it on charge. I'll use my phone as an alarm clock. I'll do all those things. So go and buy a twenty dollar alarm clock and leave your phone in the kitchen. Sounds like a great thing. So. Look, I think with that, we've gone a little bit over time, but it's been really great questions. I think lots of great information. So where to for here? Um, tonight's webinar has been recorded. Um, there'll be a quick survey um, for questions for all the attendees. Um, we really appreciate your feedback because this is the first of that transition from primary to secondary webinar that we've done. So we really would like some feedback around some of the topics that you'd want to see um, to support you in your journey while your child develops. Um, there's also um, going to be further communication to let you know once the recordings are up. And I think it's really important to make sure that if you know of a parent who um, perhaps couldn't join or that would be interested that you share that information because um, a lot of the stuff that's been discussed today, and I'm, and I'm going to reflect back on the things that Maria particularly brought up earlier in the piece, it may not be your child it may be someone else's child and being able to understand, articulate, use the tools that Michael said and know that they're services, that's a conversation starter. Oh, I've noticed that Julie hasn't been herself lately. Is everything okay? Did you know that locally we've got these great services that can help you? Give them a call or contact the interagency and talk to them. They might be able to help you because there's oodles of services that are there to support families. And quite often um, it's just a matter of communication and being able to find out. And, and as Maria said, there is very much a no wrongdoer approach on a lot of services here on the beaches. So um, councils played a really big role in that. Um, I know a lot of the, the services are funded too. So it's not about out of pocket. It's about being able to connect, explain and find the right fit for you and your young person. So hopefully tonight's been really informative for you. Um, we thank you for registering and attending and um, a big thank you to our young people who've been involved tonight, as well as Dr. Michael Carr, Greg and Maria. Yeah, we do the clicking thank yous, yay. Um, and yeah, so have a great evening. Thank you so much, everyone. Thanks for having us. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks everyone. Great. Good job, young people. Thank you. Thank you.